Have you started recording yet? Yes, we are now recording. Excellent. Perfect. Okay, welcome, people. Um, so the pre-class discussion included uh, talking about uh, both metal stamps as well as chasing and repose tools. And in my uh, kit of tools that I have made um, includes uh, several chasing tools, uh, such as see if we can get those to show up on the camera. Yeah. So I, I tend to put more decorative features on my chasing tools than I do on my regular metal stamps. But the process for making these tools is the same. Yeah, we're going to be shaping tool steel, we're going to be hardening tool steel, and we're going to be uh, tempering the tool steel. And if we don't temper the tool steel, we will have something that is very brittle and will crack when we try to hit it. And that's not good. I've had a chasing tool uh, break on me in the past and I had to replace it. That was, I had a sad. Um, let's see. So the, did you all get a chance to look at and download or uh, view the uh, outline of sources and information that I had shared? I have not. I've been um, you know, a, a, little, a little busy back-to-back -back classes this weekend, but uh, I promise I will get, uh, get a hard copy after a little while. It's it's in the uh, it's in the Facebook event for the King's College. Uh, if you want to go ahead and pull that, um, if if people want, I can actually upload it into the chat if that would help. And I cannot read what the chat message says. Oh, I didn't, and I was wondering where I could get them. I didn't get to the event page, so if you could upload it, that would be very appreciated. Let me see if we can do that. Harold, I'll go ahead and pause for right now. Okay, thank you. All right, we are recording. Uh, so go ahead and pull that up. Um, what uh, the first step in making a stamping tool is to decide what shape that you want to make your stamping tool out of uh, into. And Kofina is here in the shop and she's going to be um, my in-person uh, teaching target. And she has decided that she wants to recreate um, stamp number 113 down at the bottom of this particular page. And that page happens to be a page from the Curedale Horde, uh, a link to a PDF version of that document is available um, in my outline. Uh, so her, the process is gonna be to cut a piece of tool steel to length and hers is already cut. So I'm gonna be demonstrating uh, a method for cutting a piece of steel to length for a tool that I'm gonna be making over here as well. And careful, the camera is gonna bounce a little bit because we're about to go mobile with the camera. So the first step that I'm doing is I'm marking the length that I wish to cut. And then I'm going to be using a file and I'm gonna be using the file on the corner of a file of the file and I'm going to be uh, cutting across my metal with that corner. And when I'm filing, I'm always moving the file forward. I'm pushing from the handle or the tang and I'm pushing forward with the file.
you end up dulling your file. And if, uh, if you do see me going backwards, it's because I pulled pressure off the file and I'm no longer um, using it to cut with. So this is one method of, of cutting the, uh, the tool steel to length. By doing it on a diagonal, we actually pre-set up for uh, one of the later stages, which is where we need to have a reduced back end uh, on the striking surface. So I've, I've cut in a fair amount on that side, and now I'm going to pop over to the next space. And to start, I want to pick up that same cut that I was using and run that across the surface of the tool again. Any file will cut like this. Um, this happens to be a Nicholson speedy cut file. So it's cut uh, steel significantly faster than say this Nicholson mill bastard file. Okay. That one is more of a fine tooth. This one is a very fast cutting uh, file. And the source for this type of file is also in the, uh, the list of, of tools that I use. I can hear um, in, because I have y'all in my ears. Uh, so if you have any questions, feel free to pop off mute and, and uh, speak up. So once I have all four faces of this thing cut, uh, if it's a small enough piece of tool steel, I should be able to uh, go ahead and actually break it. This happens to be one of the largest pieces that I'm likely to be using, and it's not likely to end up breaking. So another method for cutting the steel to length would be to use a hacksaw um, or a cutoff wheel in a angle grinder. So Harold, what is your metal source for this particular piece? So this particular piece happens to be um, a piece of square tool steel, W1 tool steel from Dye Supplies. And that's uh, that first link that is on my, uh, on my handout. And I really like the pricing that they have on the W1 steel. And I really like the way it has been uh, shaping up and working for me. And I'm going to uh, grab a hacksaw and cut the uh, rest of the off because it's going to take a long time to to be able to cut it enough with a file if it was a thinner piece of metal we would have already uh, been at a point where we could break it
So we've, we've cut our, our piece to length. Um, the next step is going to be to take that piece and square it up. So Kofina is going to start squaring up the, uh, the working end of hers, and I'm going to start squaring up the working end of this one. You mean like flat on the top? Yep. And that's why you've got a, a small square. So I picked up a couple of these uh, small engineering squares. Sorry about that one. And we're going to use that to verify that uh, we have the piece cut to square. So right. take it out of your vise, and I will show you how to test your square. So we need to keep this backside here uh, chamfered. Angle. Yeah, at an angle because we want to have the striking surface be small. Um, so we're going to have you square up this end over here. And to test it, you're going to take it and you're going to lay it up here and you're going to see how there's that ridge that is sitting up, up high. Uh -huh. I don't know if you can see that in the home game. There's a TV gap. <laughs> um, and then you rotate it 90 degrees and go back and forth across the entire surface and make sure that it's square. So okay. you've got a high spot over here. We wanna make sure all that red is gone because that happens to be the end of the steel that as it came. Okay. Um, nice. My piece, I happen to have a uh, chamfering at both ends. So I'm going to choose one and I'm going to square it up. Squaring it is so you can smack it later. Squaring it is so that the surface that you're uh, stamping with is going to be uh, a square to the length of the tool, so that you're you're not stamping at an angle. Okay. So even if you were making a chasing tool, the first thing that I do is I square the uh, the end of the tool to make sure that everything is going to, going to be uh, set up square to be able to work properly. Okay, so at this point, I am square across my surface. I'm moving my square forward and backwards. I'm checking it off of different faces. What I have not done is I've not brought it down to get rid of all of the previous markings. Um, and I'm not going to do that until I decide what tool I want to be making uh, out of this particular tool blank. Because if I'm going to have to take off that metal anyways, then I might as well not bother bringing it down and, and losing almost an eighth of an inch of length on the tool if I'm just going to be filing it back down uh, for the tool shape. So I'm going to set it in here for a second and I'm going to double check the tool that I want to make. And I'm going to be doing um, tool number five down at the bottom row. So yes, there are definitely uh, sections of this particular tool where I do not need to necessarily have it be square and, and flush to the outside surfaces. And I'm looking at my source to try to determine what it is that I want it to look like. And I've got it uh, marked wrong. So I'm just going to 
give it a quick erase with a file. So that's how I think I want it to look. And where the black spots are is where I'm going to be leaving uh, the steel. And where the uh, silver spots are is where I'm going to be filing the surface away. So when we go to file the surfaces, um, one thing that we wanna do is we want to ensure that we have good sight lines on the tools. So I like to file back uh, quite a ways, a you know, good inch when possible. In fact, as I'm thinking about this, before I, before I file that part of the tool, I think I actually want to file the grooves that are gonna go down the center. And to start that, I wanna start with a small, uh, small uh, jeweler's file. The jeweler's file happens to be one from uh, Home Depot. And again, the link to that particular uh, tool is included in the outline. How deep will you do that? Uh, just enough that the uh, that the bigger file will have something to be able to ride along, so it doesn't bounce around uh, bounce around on me. So when yours is square, um, you're going to be using the uh, the dots that I gave you. The, the uh, your two holes for your punches. And you're gonna set them into the opposite corners of your, uh, of your piece, but okay. far enough in from those corners that they're not gonna pop out. Okay, which one do I start with? Got it. Start with the one that looks like a little itty bitty diamond. That's one that I, that I made. Um, and it's a good punch to, uh, to start making a hole with. Yes. Uh, yes, by hand, and you're going to use these two hammers right here. This one and this one? Yes. You're going to start with an eight ounce hammer. Absolutely. Yep. 
and I've got a fine tip sharpie if you need that as well, or an ultra fine. I just start tapping? Yes. Okay. And you want to tap lightly once okay. and look at it and make sure that you've got a hole where you want it to be because you can always file it away if it's uh, uh, if you have not gone in too deep. Okay. And here, let me uh, let me hand you the my my version of that particular tool so that you can um, double check how I had done it. That's what I'm Once you have both of the holes set, uh, you're going to want to uh, you're going to want to take it uh, several hits with the diamond tip, okay. and then you're going to move up to the uh, to the steepest of the three center punches, and then to the middle of yes, and uh, and, one, yes, and that last one. Um, you, this is probably too small of a tool to handle opening it up that big. Okay. Okay. Any questions from the uh, from the audience? Hillary would like the handout. I'll repost it. So did we have, did we have more people to join? Yes, we did. So who else is out there? Go ahead and introduce yourself while we're doing some filing here. So what I'm doing now is I am removing the pieces that are outside of the lines that I want to leave. So as I'm removing the material on the outside edge, um, I'm making sure that I rotate my uh, my vise into a position where I can reach that surface and try to keep my um, my file relatively uh, relatively parallel to the earth. 
and that's part of why I really like these uh, these three D spinning vices that I picked up at uh, Harbor Freight. Harbor Freight, I have a lot of cool stuff. You like how they uh, rotating that around uh, to rotating to the different size uh, stamps helps make mm -hmm. bigger holes. You keep in mind one of those you have to open up to the outside world. So if it happens to get too large and pop out, it's actually what you were looking to have uh, working for you in the first place. Yeah, because I bounce it right between the two. Okay. <laughs> How badly? So don't worry about the one that's in between. You're probably going to end up having to uh, file that out. Anyway. Anyways. Thank <laughs> you. 
So as I'm filing this to the shape that I wish to keep, um, I'm making sure that uh, that uh, that I'm you know make my lines parallel where where necessary and and stuff like that. Uh, once I have gotten down to that particular shape, I'm going to uh, work the backside and turn it into a square striking surface. And I'm going to uh, chamfer the back striking surface so that it's uh, got a small strike, strike plate. <laughs> Pretty close to where I need it to be for for square for the strike surface. Now I'm chamfering that back striking surface down, and the reason that I want to chamfer that the strike surface is as I'm stamping, the smaller the strike surface, the more power is going to be coming from the hammer down through the center of the tool shaft. Also, the back end is not hardened. Uh, and it will, in fact, mushroom and deform as I use the tool. So by chamfering it, um, I allow for the mushrooming to have a place to go. And if, every once in a while, I'll just pop a tool back onto a vise and I'll just file the, the, uh, the mushroom away and put it back to a nice clean chamfered striking surface again. So one of the last uh, things that I have to do is on my striking surface, I need to ease my striking edges so that um, it will better in, uh, impact and push the metal around. And for that, I'm switching to a finer file as opposed to these uh, fast cut files. And I'm just, just letting that file kiss those sharp edges just enough to, to ease the strike surfaces. Okay. Uh, you have a good start and I want you to, uh, the, the two holes that you have, I want you to make them deeper. Okay. At least one of them, make one of them deeper. Okay. Try both, because uh, one of them is gonna end up having to basically be evacuated uh -huh. as part of your okay. filing process. All right. But uh, definitely try to get both of them uh, deeper.
as part of my cleanup process, I like to go down the length of my tools and make sure that uh, that everything is is nice and eased on the surfaces where I'm likely to be holding. Any questions out there? No, there are not. Because we're about to get into um, one of the noisier parts of my process. And I'm about to uh, polish this up on my deburring wheel. So apologies in advance if uh, the noise comes through loud. Wheel. You can use uh, wet, dry sandpaper. It will just take a lot longer. And it's a friction. Uh, process, so it does get the metal a little bit warm. So this is the tool that we ended up with. Uh, it's basically, uh, it's a cross V with a little point at the bottom, a V at the top and two parallel sides. So now that we have it shaped and deburred, the next process will be to um, harden the tool steel. And for hardening it, I happen to have a, uh, a Smith um, Jewelers Silver Smith Torch. And it has different size uh, tips that I have available. I, as you can see, I've got a uh, one of my little um, portable vices uh, holding the tool tip. Um, I'm actually going to switch out to a slightly heavier torch head.
And over on the right, um, I've got a quench tank filled with mineral oil. And over in the back side, I've got another quench tank filled with water. For hardening it, even though it's a W1, which means that it would be water hardenable, I'm gonna harden it inside the mineral oil because I like uh, how it feels and looks when it quenches in mineral oil. And so far I've had really good luck uh, quenching it a little bit slower than it was that its design specifications called for. And as you can see, I'm keeping the uh, blue working point of the flame uh, just off the tool and waiting for the uh, bottom third of the tool to get to a bright orange. And I've used a, a set of um, uh, fire brick that I happen to have to make a, a little uh, soldering cave, a, a torch cave, and that helps uh, this process by actually reflecting the heat back on the back side of the tool. And it makes it uh, such that uh, it warms up a little bit faster. And by using the heavier torch head, um, So over. All right. Um, are you going to be able to get the recording back up or, or you want, I, I put the, okay. Carol just, oh, there we go. All right. Let me get you repinned and you are upside down, but we can see you. All right. There we go. We are back. Okay, so uh, what we missed was the fact that I got this uh, piece of steel up to bright orange uh, while it was in the torch. I came over, I quenched it in the oil, it sputtered and flamed, it was really beautiful. Uh, Y'all missed that because, well, uh, iPhones have overheat protection built in. And then after I had the flames out, I brought it over to the water and that cooled it enough that I would be able to actually pick it up with my fingers. So in order to verify that I have achieved hardness on this particular tool, and it is still warm by the way. So uh, what we do is we would do a file File test. Let's uh, turn off the microphone on this. Good. Because I'm actually now going through the uh, audio on the computer. Uh, so if I take a, a regular file and I, you can hear it skating right across that surface where I have hardened it. And if I test it on the backside, you can hear it and feel it cutting in differently. So it actually, you see it starting to polish it and up on this side, it's just basically bouncing off the surface. So we have achieved hardness, but right now we are so hard that if I tried stamping with it, it would actually end up shattering at some point. So we now have to temper it. To temper it, I'm gonna take it back over to the deburring wheel and I'm gonna polish off all this carbon and make, it, make that carbon go away. I don't know if the video is skipping or. Yeah. 
Yeah. But anyways, I have to polish the carbon off because the tempering process is I'm going to be uh, heating the center of the tool with a lighter weight flame, and I'm going to watch the color change move down towards the tip. And hopefully we'll have the ability to show that. Uh, first, we're going to polish. And it's getting warm, so I'm going to put my gloves on. Okay, we have achieved polish. Um, I'll now be able to see the uh, color change for the tempering process. And for this tempering process, I'm gonna be using a, a smaller torch head. which happens to be the large torch head that I use for smaller tools. But this particular piece is going to take a bit to, uh, to warm up. Um, so let's come a little bit closer. And then as I am holding the, uh, the torch, you should be able to see color starting to show up on the tool. And I'm applying this, this heat to the center of the tool. And this tempering process is going to be to relax the crystalline structure that we created when we hardened steel. And it's a fairly hefty piece of steel, so it's going to take a little bit to uh, to get some heat into it before it actually start uh, having a color change. So we're starting to see uh, straw yellow showing up. And what we want to do is we want to have that straw yellow come down to the very tip of the tool. And as you can see, the center is getting a little warmer. We've gotten into uh, brown and blue and purple. And so I, what I did was I saw that straw getting down to the tip of the tool and I immediately quenched it directly into water. Uh, the tempering quench needs to get that heat out of it as quickly as possible, so it goes directly into the water. We're not hardening it, so we're not looking to uh, cool it slow. We want to cool it nice and fast and be able to hold that, uh, that temper and stop the heat immediately. 
So as you can see, we have a tool that has just a little bit of uh, straw yellow at the tip. Um, and in the back side of that tool, uh, it got a little bit warm, but uh, it, it's going to end up working nicely as a stamp. We still have a bunch of heat sitting in here. And I'm gonna do one final polish on the, uh, the 320 grit uh, deburring wheel uh, to give the surface a final polish. And I'm not gonna polish the outside of the tool because I wanna leave uh, evidence behind of how I tempered uh, so that in the event of a future tool failure, I can recreate what process I used uh, to be able to determine what works and what does not work. And so far I have not had any of the tools that I've created fail on me. I have had tools that I purchased from other people fail, um, but I did not, they did not leave their tempering marks on the tools. They gave it a final polish. I was not able to tell uh, exactly how their uh, process was. So one final polish and this tool will be done. And that's it. One stamping tool, uh, start to finish. Cool. And we'll just put it into the rack of tools that we made. Uh, and see the, uh, the tools on the right are chasing and refuse and chisels. Uh, the runs on the left are stamps that I have made, uh, all sourced out of the Curedale Horn book. And then there's this stamp here, which was uh, the third stamp that I ever made. And that one is my maker's mark. And that's not based on any historical piece, it's, but it is a uh, Viking binder of my H and my B. Art. Sure. Uh, let's. Um, Harold, do you want to open it up for verbal questions? Sure. Okay, I shall unmute anybody. Oh. If anyone has any questions. I do actually, I didn't quite hear the source for the tools that were created that are on the left. The ones that are not for chasing and repoussé. Uh, Curedale, um, in, uh, in the handout, the, uh, the handout that I put out, uh, there's a reference that says sources, and in it is a link to the Curedale uh, board, uh, board available as a PDF. Yeah. Harold, I can no longer hear you. I believe that I muted and I muted the wrong thing there. So please mute and unmute the right thing for me, please. Okay, I should be I should be unmuted now. Yes, I am the also unmuted. Harold, okay, great, thank you. So Sorry. what was the last thing y'all heard from me? Uh, somebody asked me a question on the Curedale Horde and I mentioned that uh, the Curedale Horde book uh, is listed in my sources and I've got it. Uh, there's a PDF of it that I'm making available because uh, I was able to find it on the internet. It's no longer on the internet, but I'm making it available anyways. 
So I'm going to use the stamp that I've just got done making. And you'll notice that I started from the center and I'm working out on this one. So would this process change based on the metal you're going to be working on? Uh, as far as the stamping? The, the bracelet or other, uh, not the tool, but the, the project you're working on. So this particular piece, um, I'm trying to recall if this is, uh, I think this is aluminum. Um, I've, stamped uh, aluminum, I've stamped uh, copper, bronze, brass, uh, nickel, silver, and stainless steel. And the process for stamping is the same. Uh, the thicker the material that you're stamping, the better the stamps are going to come out. And you'd use the same tools for all of those metals? Absolutely. Cool. Well, this particular pattern, I decided I wanted to rotate. Um, I could have chosen to have the uh, the arrows pointing inwards or outwards and, and just gone down the length. Um, I could have chosen to gone at the edge and have it pointing inwards. Uh, but this, this particular piece, I decided to go down mostly the center. And it break, to take that into a, an armband, I'll use the horn of the anvil. Now with, um, with copper-based metals, such as copper, brands, uh, brass, bronze, brass, I can speak, maybe I should drink something. Um, <laughs> it will work harden better than what I'm seeing with the aluminum. But the aluminum is relatively inexpensive and it comes pretty much uh, cut to shape mostly pre-finished. And so that's uh, what it ends up looking like after you use it to stamp something. Here you go, for you. <laughs> Thank you for acting as my camera today. <laughs> and I think we're at time now. Um, Carol Durst, so I'll go ahead and stop the recording. Uh, or were we we're longer? Not we're not at three o'clock, are we? Oh, okay. You're, I didn't realize you were going to three. Yeah, we're, we're a two hour class. <laughs> so I have a question. Sure. Uh, this, is, this is Hillary. Um, I always have to stop and think when I'm doing 
the heat tempering, am I going to use water or am I going to use the oil? Can you so, review that again? Sure. Um, so I have mostly W1 tool steel, uh, which is water hardenable. But because it's, I'm dealing with small pieces, I'm not dealing with a big knife or a sword, um, the heat is coming out of it quickly enough that, uh, that I'm able to quench using mineral oil. So because some of my steel was O1 tool steel uh, and some of it was W1 tool steel, I just decided I'm always going to quench in oil. Uh, that way I don't have to worry about it. The other benefit that I get from quenching in that oil is it, uh, I, I like the feel of the surface that it makes when it, uh, when it quenches in the oil. It uh, gives me a little bit of, um, of, a, of a rust inhibitor. Mm -hmm. Right. So even though, it, you know, even though I'm using the water quench steel, I'm actually quenching it in oil. Okay, thanks. And mineral oil. So that's a nice right. clean oil. Uh, you can see the, uh, the residue at the bottom. Um, I've been using this for months, actually years now. Uh, and I just added a little bit more today because you know, it, it burns off as you go to quench. Uh, now for tempering, you always quench for tempering directly into water. You never quench that into oil because you want to pull that heat out as rapidly as possible. Because you don't want the heat getting any more to the tip than, uh, than it was when you saw the straw hitting the tip and moving directly to quench. Uh, the process for making a chasing tool is going to be very similar to what we were just doing. The differences are going to be that um, a chasing tool, you're going to be wanting to be more careful about the rounding and shaping. Uh, before I would harden the chasing tool, I would actually put a, uh, a, a scrap piece of metal down on a, uh, on a, on a pitch pot. Um, and I would double check and make sure that it's actually going to go through and trace, uh, trace a line or, or you know, do, do what chasing tools are, are designed to do. You also, in a chasing tool, you want to have a longer shaft uh, because you're holding it back further. Uh, good, clean sight lines so that you can see where you're, where you're chasing. Because you're going to be tapping that little itty bitty hammer a lot. And you don't want to have your fingers way down at the bottom with a short little tool. So having a, a big, long tool helps to uh, keep your fingers far away from the working surface so you can see what it is you're trying to, to work. Does that make sense? Sure. And then um, I, sometimes I get fancy with the tool. Uh, so before I hardened this particular tool, uh, I heated up the center with a torch while it was mounted in a vise, and I twisted uh, first one direction, uh, free twist, and then I heated up the, uh, the next section, and I twisted it the other direction, also the same number of, of twists. And then the fun part, making sure that you got that all back to being straight and square again. Then once I had the twist put in, then I hardened the, uh, the tip and uh, polished it and tempered. And like I said, I've done that for only the chasing tools so far. Um, it, I, I like the extra surface, it, it helps. Um, Gives me something to uh, to hold on to, and just feels nicer. Although I have done it for chisels as well, again for the same purpose for being able to hold it. Uh, the chisels, this, these are little little bitty chisels designed to be able to do pierce work. So rather than using a jeweler's uh, saw, which is way post Viking and uh, even most of period. Uh, you would use a chisel to do the cutting.
So we can work with Kofina to finish up her tool. Um, I can make another tool real quick. I've got a piece cut to size. Uh, I can answer questions. Kofina is interested in finishing. So you're going to, on your piece, you're going to, uh, I want you to, where's the Sharpe? You're going to basically file. Corners off. Then you're going to round this backside here a little bit. Okay. Round that backside there a little bit. Okay. And you're going to open up one of these. So what I would do first is I would bring that edge down. And the easiest way to do that is to to mount it diagonally in your vise. Mm -hmm. And now you should be able to file straight across there. Okay. okay. With, um, with with a big file, yes. Okay. You want to actually work from that corner, okay? Because you want to bring your corner your down. your that corner down, not not the whole thing, but that just that corner. Okay. So, any other questions out there? Let's see what we have chat here. You mentioned um, the the Curdale horde, I guess. Um, the Curdale horde, yes. Yeah, so you can can you talk about that a little bit? What's involved sure. in that? Uh, Curedale horde is uh, a Hiberno Norse uh, silver horde that was found uh, round about the turn of the century, and unfortunately, most of it got dispersed long before uh, it should have. Um, but luckily, enough analysis was done that we were able to find. Uh, percentages of what the silver was. Um, the uh, it's a it's a book um, put up by uh, I think the British Museum, edited by uh, James Graham Campbell. Sorry, I'm getting some water. And in that book, um, around page 143 of the PDF that I have, we start with uh, some of the long stamps that are found. And the stamps analysis goes up through page 148. And other interesting pages that are in there are like up around page 331, where we start seeing examples of armbands that were found that have stamp decorations on them, uh, including uh, page 332, which Balgwin will recognize, having seen that, uh, that particular uh, pair in person, I think at the V&A. So what Colfina is doing is she is uh, shaping the uh, and bringing the, the corners down so that uh, she will be able to round out the outside edges. And then she's going to use a needle file to open up one of her two round holes uh, to make a, uh, a stamp that's in this Curedale Horde book on page uh, 150, uh, on page 147, stamp number 
Well, Harold, I'm going to have to run, but thank you for the class. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you for coming. Okay. How much more and what? <laughs> okay, all that's left now is to decide which of those two you want to open up and uh, turn into the open side of the S. Okay. Of the two, I would recommend I would recommend keeping that side mm -hmm. because it's a bit solider that and I would open it up over here. Okay. And to start. <laughs> and I'm using this? Sure, you can start with that. And eventually you're gonna want uh, the round. Sorry folks, uh, the camera has overheated again. Um, I think you can still hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, sorry about that. The, the camera does not like being out here in the heat today. And transmitting and uh, using the camera and, 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 and. So while we're waiting for the camera to cool down, uh, do we have any other questions? Um, I was wondering if this uh, process could be used to make um, chisels to cut buttonholes, um, a simple to stripe, a buttonhole chisel. Um, Absolutely, for making... I've, I've actually have made one. Um, uh, I made a set uh, or a, a couple of those um, for Mr. Statiana. And yes, the exact same process would be used to do that. Uh, part of what you would do, and let me see if I can come up with another camera view. Looks like the camera is cooling down enough. Okay. So here is a piece that I made, uh, a couple of different pieces that I made that are, uh, I made them by getting and deforming the ends and getting them to spread out. Uh, the exact same process is what I did for making Tatiana's uh, buttonhole uh, chisel. Uh, her, a, a regular buttonhole chisel could also be something as simple as this, which is a small chisel designed for uh, cutting silver. or a slightly larger version of that same uh, sharp chisel. You can see how sharp that edge is. And again, I, I started by deforming the metal while hot. So I put it on a torch uh, and then brought it directly to my anvil and pounded it out uh, to make it uh, spread um, using a cross pane after squishing the metal down to be able to spread the metal. And the pin has to go down these, down the length, because that will then spread the metal to the side by having the pin uh, landing like so. Let me see if I can find a, a peening hammer as an example. Okay, so this is a cross beam hammer. So basically, it's got a, uh, a rounded surface that when it hits, 
is going to spread the metal this way by hitting like so. And because it's steel, it needs to be worked while hot. So I had to bring this up to at least cherry red or hotter, um, then move it to an anvil and hammer. And then put it back on the heat, get it hot again, and hammer. How many strikes do you think you would need to do to get it to spread that far since you're striking with just the, the narrow end of the hammer? Uh, so the first thing I did was I actually squished the corners down a little bit um, so that I could actually get the peening hammer in a bit. Um, I think with a, with a big hammer like this, which weighs 24 ounces, this actually will move metal faster than a small peening hammer. Uh, so a lot of it will depend upon the size of your hammer and how hot you got it and how long it takes you to get from your heat source to your anvil. Uh, if you're working in a forge, uh, you would have the ability to get the more of the steel hotter, you would end up spreading that end before cutting it to length. Does that make sense? And yeah, you know, an experienced smith could probably spread that in one, maybe two heats. Uh, somebody who's new at this might use uh, three or four heats or more. That's good to know, yes. It then looks like it's the same process if somebody wanted to make pinking tools. I yes. was uh, able to take a class given by the ladies of the Tudor Taylor um, in the Chicago area a couple years ago, they had a beautiful set of pinking tools. Um, mm -hmm. if this is not my period, but I just had to admire the workmanship that had kind of a lacy effect in the area yes. where it spread. And that is actually um, the, the tools that I made for Mr. Statiata are in fact pinking tools. I, I, I misspoke earlier when I said that they were buttonholed. Uh, but you can, you can use any chisel to do a buttonhole. Uh, pinking is a little bit harder. So you want to have that opened up just a little bit more. So come in with the, there should be a round in that, in that case. Yes. So you want to come in that like way. so. Okay. And open up that round a little bit. Okay. Okay. All right. And after that, uh, we're going to want to make sure that all of your edges are eased because it'll be ready to go on for polish. And you can put that onto the uh, the other jeweler handle, the file file handle. You just un loosen it up a little bit, pop the other one out. And those jewelers files are relatively inexpensive at, at ten dollars for the set, and they they work really well. If necessary, go ahead and hold it against the lead ledge of the vice, like, okay. like like that. Oh, okay. So that way you're pushing against it. That's the thing. Yeah. Okay. And I don't know if uh, she has used the pinking uh, chisels that I made for her or not. Um, she's had a, I mean, we've had a tough year and a half, two years. Yes, it's been quite uh, challenging. <laughs> Um, the chisels, um, I had a buttonhole chisel um, made as part of a Smith's challenge at our big summer event in North Shield. And okay. it was made out of uh, cylindrical stock, but it had been spread wide like that to the, um, the width that I needed. And it's going to be used for cutting holes uh, in uh, the edge of a cotardy. Cool. So, um, 
uh, not all the way to the edge, but so the mm -hmm. uh, they it can accommodate the buttons attached to the edge on the other side, and it, it's a just delightful piece to have because it looks so right. It's a nice yeah. utilitarian tool, and um, um, there's something elegant about having a a tool that works specifically for the purpose intended. Yes, and especially. Um, those picking tools. Uh, I hadn't really looked at late period clothing, and then uh, Tatiana asked me to uh, to help her make one. Um, so we, I made one for her, and she made one, and uh, I did some research, and there was a lot of repetitive cuts, and they were all identical. So you, you know that they were using. A, a chisel with a preset uh, uh, spacing and, and stuff like that. So it, it was really interesting. Yeah, Very so similar in effect to a leather worker's uh, lacing chisel uh, where you, know, you would go ahead and, and use uh, to cut say either rectangles or diagonals to be able to uh, lace the edge of a, of a leather piece. The nice thing about the um the pinking tools and the um, buttonhole chisel is there's an absolute perfect strike in a straight line. You don't have the issue with the scissors where you may bobble at the end and there's a tiny fray where it picked up a thread from uh, the adjacent area and right. it's, it's clean. So, so efficient. Kofina, how are you doing? Oh, I'm not sure how much further I need to go. I think you have achieved a hole. Um, <laughs> what I want you to do is to use, uh, let's say, this chisel, this file here. Okay. Um, we're going to go around the outside here a little bit more and make sure that you have that uh, nicely rounded. Okay. Just kind of See how I, just a little bit of strokes uh -huh. has caused that to be a little bit more rounded than it was. Yeah. So there's a couple more places in there that you can round it just a bit more. All right. Now don't go crazy. I'll try not to. And then after that, I want you to knock down any sharp edges. And then we'll be ready to polish and. Uh, Harden, then polish again and heat treat. Any other questions out there? You mentioned a PDF of the of the uh, document. Um, I've been looking on the British Museum, but I haven't found anything of the uh, Curedale. There is a the outline that I have. Yeah. Did you do you have a copy of that outline? Yes. Yes. Uh, go ahead, open that up. Uh, it should open in either Open Office or even I got it. Uh, Microsoft Word. I got it. There should be there should be the link where it says Curedale Hoard should open. Oh, up. Oh, there it is. Um, okay, I found it. And the on other my per on my personal website. Okay, and then I found the other one for Nancy Megan Corwin is also there. You have a, a link to, I guess, a book. Okay, great. Oh yeah, yes, uh, that's the Chasing a Repose um, right. uh, from Brit Morgan Press. Uh, oh yeah, McCray. Yes. Yeah, I have a copy of that autographed by Mr. McCray. I got to meet him at an enamel conference a couple years back. I, Very nice. I was guy. lucky enough to take a uh, workshop with him, and nice. that's where I learned some of the uh, uh, additional techniques of making these tools, such as chamfering the backsides, making the striking surfaces smaller, right. um, uh, easing that upper edge, giving it a nice final polish. Uh, we ended up making my stamps much better after I, I 
hardened them and polished them. So you got a cup, you, you were able to find the Cordell well, book? I'm, I'm using your link, but it's just opening up my Google um, Docs site. So let me try this again. You might have to copy the whole link URL. I did. And paste it. Okay. Okay. The whole point is get it to the shape that you like. This looks like an alphabet. I don't like it. <laughs> and don't forget to uh, chamfer the backside when we're ready to uh, give the final polish. by chamfering? Yes. You see how you've got a little bit of a sharp edge there? Mm -hmm. You want to get that smoothed out okay. uh, and make them all about the same. Okay. Here, let me show you an example that you're mm -hmm. going to target. You want it to look very much like that. Okay. Got it. Okay? Yeah. We'll use that. Yes, it does.
So it looks like that link to my file is not popping up properly. Yeah, I was I was just going to ping you privately, but everybody else is probably going to want to get a copy as well. Yeah. I've been trying to see if I can find it online, but it's no, it's that's the problem. Possible. It's uh, yep. I find little articles, but not the full PDF that you mentioned with that many pages. So, well, I think the recording will identify who was probably on the class if you wanted to send it to them privately. or unless you can find it and post it in the chat. Working on it. Unless it's not set for share. So this is uh, a link to my PDS uh, folder on my Google Drive. So let's okay. go ahead and somebody I'm open that try up that. and make sure that it works. Yep, let me try that. There it is. Yeah, you got light brown, I've got that. So it's the Curedale Online 2 local PDF? Yes. Okay, let me try that, see if I can get it. Come on. Download. Now go ahead and use the red handle file and just ease those uh, those edges just a little bit. You need to be yeah. less, less sharp. Less sharp. <laughs> and actually, if you were to go like so, mm -hmm. you'll find that um, you're not running parallel uh, to the uh, to the groups. Okay. By going like this, you, the those grooves mm -hmm. are bouncing more. Oh. But here they're cutting more. Okay. okay, so be aware of the cutting surfaces on your file. That's good. Now flip to the next one. Oh. You just need a little bit of easing. Uh, and there's several other PDFs in that particular folder. Okay, are they available for viewing? That's why that whole file okay. folder is shared. shared. Okay, yep. I downloaded it, it went pretty quick. So I'm gonna open it up and make sure I got it correctly. Yeah, the only one that's in there that is questionable uh, is gonna be the Curedale. And that's because it used to be available on the interwebs, but I haven't been able to find it in the past year. Yeah. So I don't know if they uh, Did took you get it, it offline. Did you get it directly from the museum? Um, I believe so. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I, I did a look for PDFs and, and it was like, you know, multiple pages. So it may be there. It's just not going to it directly. Right. Okay. Let me go to the end. I want to make sure I got it all. Uh, what page am I on? I did find somebody who was selling, um, uh, a 64 gigabyte uh, USB stick with all kinds of documents on it. Wow. One of which was the Curedale Horde. Okay, I got 387 pages it's opened up. It's a lot more money. Okay, we like. So it is successful. So. Okay. It's a little rough on the actual design. Okay, so the last thing we want to do is I want you to take um a small jeweler's file okay. with a flap and i want you to just lightly ease those top edges okay do i need to worry about the inside of the circle nope because that uh 
was handled as part of the process of expanding it. Yeah. Okay. So there's a little bit of more around this this circle, okay. but most of it's already done. It, it, it not very much at all. I just want it to be just slightly eased so that there's not a sharp edge. Um, okay. This is not much. So do we still have left on? Let's see, Hillary and Jeanette and and Taji. I'm sure. I'm with you. It's it's uh the like uh, Annette is to Anne and Anisha is to Anya. Okay. And Bia, who I guess is coordinating. Yes, Bia is handling our recording. So. Let's go ahead and get your gloves on because you're going to be coming over and doing some polishing. Ooh, hot metal is my favorite. Yes, try not to grind the uh, the leather gloves off. I will try. No promises. I know. Okay. So the goal is just to make the whole thing shiny. Yes. Shiny is the goal. Okay. Yes. Power. Yes. That's fine. Is there like a direction that it Yes. Do? So this end, you want to come in straight on. Okay. And you can see how it's polishing it up. Yeah. And then those openings, okay. you want to come in on the, on the corners okay. and then around the outside, okay. coming in like this, that angle. And now that, take, that is taken care of everything that we needed to do on the tip. Okay. Okay. Now you're having the hammer. Now, I do now you're going to be working it so that it's basically aiming downwards. Okay. And you want to be working the the edges as well as the face. Okay. okay? Yeah, you definitely don't want to be having the pointing upwards because then it'll try to catch it and fling it back at you. And these uh, wheels are very similar to a, uh, a 3M deburring wheel. Except that a 3M deburring wheel costs anywhere from fifty to one hundred and twenty dollars, uh, and these wheels, in eight inch instead of six inch, ended up costing eighteen or fifteen dollars. Don't forget to polish the striking surface as well. And you got the corners as well as the, the flat surfaces? Good. Okay. Yep. Sure. Okay. So you notice that I'm angling it upwards? Uh, because what I when you put it into the quench, the quench happens to be a plastic container. Uh -huh. Do not let the bright hot orange metal <laughs> melt the hole through the plastic container, leaking my oil all over the floor. Good, <laughs> okay. Okay. 
Because it is such a small uh, surface, a small, small uh, cross section, it's going to heat up faster than that big piece that I made. <laughs> if the phone has been overheating because I believe uh, the charging and, and the fact that it's 90 degrees in the shop today. We're starting to see orange coming down the shaft. Uh, we want about an inch, a little bit more than an inch. <laughs> so at this point, you can go ahead and pick up the, uh, yep, and go ahead and quench. And it keeps swirling it around. It wasn't as impressive as the first one. Well, there's a lot less heat in, in, <laughs> in this one. And now I'll go ahead and put it in the water. It is, you, know, you hear that there's still a little bit of heat left in there. It's yep. And now you can go ahead and wipe it down with the towel. Go ahead and take it off the vice grips just by popping it open. And go ahead and do a uh, hardness test. Here's the file. Does it matter where? Anywhere on that end. Go ahead, right, right on, the, on, the, on the flat surface. You're skating? Yeah. Now try the back side. Very different. Way different. Now, way different. Now go ahead and polish it up. Okay. That's why you left your gloves on. As long as you can see silver everywhere, it's good enough. Back onto a vice grip and at an angle. And I've already swapped out uh, the tip on the torch. Okay. I went from a, uh, I believe I had been using uh, number two or number one. I think no, actually we were using a number two, I believe. And now we're down to a, uh, to a number zero. So it should be a very small flame. Uh, it should make it uh, slower for heating. Okay. And if it's too slow, then we'll, um, then we'll uh, swap out to a slightly heavier. Yes. Yeah. 
Or do I move Just hold it there for a little bit until you start seeing some color coming into it. A little on the edge. We're looking for color on the surface. Okay, you're, you're getting brown. Okay. Now bring it in and out a little bit. This way? Uh, on and off, just off to the side. Let it, uh, let it move towards the tip a little more. Bring it back in. Okay. And that yellow. So what we're looking for is we're looking for that yellow to touch the tip. Okay. So just keep bringing it on and off. A little bit more heat. It's cooling down a little bit too quickly. I mean, move it on longer. Yes, please. Okay, we're starting to get that color moving again. Yep, I see it. And quench right now. And wipe it. This just dries it off, right? Yeah. The magic in the paper towel. The magic <laughs> in the paper towel is that it's no longer wet and oil. And the fact that the paper towel has oil residue left on it, and so that all uh, helps. So you want to do a little bit of polish to the very tip okay. on the right hand side. Just the top or all the way around? Just the top and ever so slightly around it. Looks like we're coming up on the end of our scheduled 3 p.m. end of the class. And we have succeeded in making two different tools. Any final questions before we wrap up? I want your studio. Normally, it has a pair of motorcycles sitting in it. <laughs> <laughs> ah, there's the uh, there's the RVs or the van. Yep. Okay. Yeah, the yard has uh, two cargo trailers, two RVs, um, both of which are used for storage at the moment. <laughs> okay. And. Uh, We've had uh, the lawn tractor and both motorcycles and all the lawnmowers in here. It gets really crowded when all the equipment is is in here, all the the bikes. Uh, yeah. But I try not to leave the bikes out. I don't leave the bikes out overnight. So. Yeah. Substitute moderator is is stopping the recording now. <laughs>